Good morning. Thank you all for being here. We're just watching some folks come in, so we're admitting them, and we'll get started in about one minute here. <laughs> All right. I think we're starting to slow down a bit on folks coming in. Thanks everyone for being very prompt this morning. I'm always impressed when I have a tendency to see the calendar invite and then forget completely. So I'm impressed. <laughs> so Welcome. Um, we are the Western Montana Conservation Commission, and um, thanks for joining us today for our informational meeting about some grant funding opportunities we have coming up. So these are all drafted. These are all in development. We're just getting ready, kind of kicking off with all of you as we start to build up this program, which is really exciting. So to start us off, if you could introduce yourself in the chat, include your organization, We'll keep track of questions today in the chat. We'll keep track of who's here in the chat today. So please feel free to add that. And as you are introducing yourself, I'll tell you what we're up to today. So the purpose of this meeting is to sort of give you this sneak peek into our draft program. So we've been working on building up this grant program um, we were awarded a large award, and now we get to award some other folks um, from this award, and we're really excited to do so. So we're building up all these guidelines for that. Um, any chat, like I said, any questions you have, please feel free to put them in the chat um, so that we can respond to them, and that'll help us build up our FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions section, as we are publishing these grant guidelines and such. And then this is just the beginning. So we'll have future meetings and there'll be public comment period and all that stuff on these guidelines and grant program aspects coming up in the future. So today we'll introduce the staff of the Western Montana Conservation Commission. I'll give you some background on who we are and then we'll jump into those future grant programs. And then we have some great uh, mini presentations from folks who have partnered with us in the past and with our past commissions on two really great programs that are very similar to some of the work that you could see in this grant program. And then we'll have time for feedback and questions. And like I said, please feel free to put anything in the chat. We've got, I think, seven of us here <laughs> from the WMCC staff, and we can get answer those questions or make sure they're addressed at the end in that feedback section. So to kick it off, Let's introduce you to our grant specific staff if Kristen wants to start. And Kristen, you're muted. Sorry about that. Can you folks hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hi, my name is Kristen Jordan, and I am fairly new to the commission. I am a grant program specialist, so I will be working with eligible grantees when they get their awards, um, offering some technical assistance and providing help wherever I can to um, folks who receive some of these grant funds. And I'll pass it on to somebody else. Heidi, Good go morning. ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Heidi Flurry, and I'm also a grant program specialist. Uh, I've been working in soil and water conservation in Western Montana since 2014. And I used to work at the Lake County Conservation District and am new here with WMCC at the beginning of the year. And I really look forward to working on these programs and grants with everyone. And finally, Krista. 
Good morning, everybody. I'm Krista Lammers. I am the grant administrative specialist, so I'll do a lot of the grant management, some of the background stuff, but also here to help anyone um, throughout the program. I see a lot of familiar names and faces. Welcome. We're really excited to share this information with you today. Thank you. And now for the rest of our staff, here is our commission staff, and we'll start with Casey. Good morning. I'm Casey Lewis, and I'm the executive director of WMCC. And uh, I, I wanted to mention our staff are spread out across Western Montana. So I'm in the Flathead area, but we also have a number of staff in the Missoula area. So uh, it helps makes it easier for us to meet in person when needed as well. Emily, you can go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Henry. I'm one of the program coordinators for WMCC. Um, I've been around in some capacity with this, this work since about 2020, um, currently based in the Missoula area. And my name is Stephanie Murphy. I am the communications coordinator for the crew. Um, I have a background in biology, ecology, education, outreach, lots of fun stuff, and I'm out of Missoula. And finally, to wrap it up, we'll introduce Kelly. Hi, I am Kelly and I'm the other program coordinator for WMCC. And my background is also in soil and water. And as of two weeks ago, I'm also down in the Missoula area. Thanks all. And we'll include all of our contact info at the end, um, as well as a link to our website where you can find that information as well. So we are the Western Montana Conservation Commission. And we have gone recently from two staff members to now seven within probably 10 months, which is amazing and wonderful. And we've been growing a lot. So WMCC was established in 2023 on July 1st through the legislative session. So we were legislatively created through Senate Bill 83. And we combined, effectively combined, and replace the roles of the Flathead Basin Commission and the Upper Columbia Conservation Commission. So we're taking the 40 years of experience of the Flathead Basin Commission in emphasizing education and outreach around water quality protection, non-point source pollution, basically taking care of our waters and uh, bolstering efforts to make sure that everyone else also cares about water quality in the basin. And we're extending those efforts across Western Montana which was the full range of the Upper Columbia Conservation Commission, which was formed in 2017 and focused on aquatic invasive species prevention and bolstering the efforts of fish, wildlife and parks, AIS programs, as well as doing a lot of outreach in the community, in industries and with legislators. So the Western Montana Conservation Commission has these sort of combined goals of both water quality protection and aquatic invasive species protection. So our mission really is to protect the waters we have in Western Montana. And in Western Montana, we are the headwaters of the Columbia River Basin, which will come into play as the title of this grant is the Columbia River Basin Toxics Reduction. And I'll tell you more about that in a bit. So here is our um, where we serve. So we've kind of broken it out by these different watersheds. Um, you can look and interact with this map on our website as well. But really, it's just west of the Continental Divide. And this will be the same area for applicable grant programs. And like Casey said, our staff is spread everywhere from Whitefish down to Missoula. So we're all around and we're all reachable. We're happy to meet in person to talk about stuff too. Our commission has 34 total members, which is a large commission. 16 of those members are voting and nine of those voting members are govern governor appointed. And so you can see that kind of broken down in this great graphic that Emily put together of these governor appointed members in that brown gold color and the other voting members in that blue color. And then you'll see all of our advisory members are from different state, federal and tribal agencies who do work in Montana and help protect these resources together. So our last meeting was was it just last week? It was June 4th and 5th, and we met in Kalispell and got together quite a few of these members. So if you're ever in the area, uh, our meetings are gigantic and fun since we have 34 members. So come swing by and chat with us sometime. 
at this last meeting, we established some committees and we have some other committees that are in development. So we have our executive committee committee that meets every two weeks pretty regularly, with some exceptions in case members aren't available. And then we voted into creation the Education, Outreach, and Communication Committee, which I am the staff support on, the Aquatic Invasive Species Committee, which Emily is the staff support on, and the Monitoring and Coordination Committee, which Kelly and Casey are the staff supports on, but mainly Kelly. And then we have two more committees, since we have lots of stuff going on, who that are still developing and might be of particular interest to you all here who have joined us. We have our on-site wastewater treatment committee, which is in a development phase. So we've set up our committees to sort of come up with this plan, develop, come up with some goals so that once they feel ready, they can bring that to the commission and we can vote them into creation. So that on-site wastewater is still in that development phase. And that's focusing on septic leachate and other issues like that, including impacts to the water quality, research, treatments, other solutions that may be needed in Western Montana. And then the Stormwater Oops Advisory Council is a special EPA grant-driven uh, council committee, um, we're calling it a council, um, but this is through the EPA grant and we received um, it includes a group of stormwater experts that work with some of our EPA grant funds to develop resources and increase capacity to support green stormwater infrastructure in Montana. And you'll hear more about that. There's more to come with that and should align well with some of these grant programs in the future. And feel free to reach out to any of us if you would like to be involved with these committees. They're fresh and brand new and we are starting to get to the point where we want to open it up to outside partners beyond just our commission, even if you just like to come and attend a meeting or two here and there. So let me tell you about our big grant. So this is the Columbia River Basin Toxics Reductions Lead Grant, and we were one of the lucky organizations to be awarded this grant. We were awarded $7 million just about, and that funds three staff for us who you met originally in the beginning here, um, Krista, Kristen, and Heidi. And then at 3.2 or just about 3.2 million of that will go directly to these competitive grant programs, which is really cool. And we're really excited to bring that money into Western Montana. The grant itself or the award itself has three main areas of focus. So the first one is community research and education. Uh, and we were provided some funds to do some comprehensive research in our communities in Western Montana to establish baseline resonant knowledge about toxic pollution from stormwater or septic systems, and then take that education or take that research and apply it to our education campaign, which is called Montana Waters Clearly Connected. And that will help inform us of how to best reach our audiences, how to best work with partners, so that we can have this consistent messaging about how we can protect water quality in our communities. The second pot of our big focus area is our stormwater toxics reduction, excuse my cap. And these are focused on green stormwater infrastructure projects, which Kelly will be telling you about in a bit, um, to help reduce runoff and mitigate pollution. This includes large showcase uh, projects, as well as residential initiatives like rain gardens or rain barrel programs. And then our last main area of focus is this septic leachate toxics reduction. So it's incentivizing proper septic maintenance and operation. Uh, it includes residential septic system maintenance, septic system replacements or connectivity to sewers or other services. Um, and supporting the planning of the septage treatment facility in Flathead County. And at our last commission meeting, we did vote in to approve those funds going over to the planning of the Flathead County septage treatment facility. So if you're interested in that, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'll also have the minutes, or we'll have, um, what was I gonna say? We have all of this info on the agenda and you're happy, you're welcome to reach out to us about how that went through our commission. All right, now that I've done a big introduction of who we are and where we are getting this funding from, I'd like to pass it over to Kristen.
Can you hear me? Sorry, I'm having serious tech issues today. I apologize. Um, so yeah, I'm Kristen. I'm going to walk you through some of the higher level details of the grant. Um, just Steph, I'm not sure if you saw, I cannot see the presentation. So um, if it's not already on the application award and timeline frame, could you put it on that slide, please? Thank you. So <clears throat> before we get into the specifics of each grant that is available, I'm going to do an overview of some of the parameters that apply to each one. Um, eligible entities will be able to apply for each grant type um, as of January of 2025, and we expect to distribute the funds um, in the spring of next year. Each award type has a certain amount of funds available, and we will hold the grants open until all the money in that particular pot is done or has been distributed. Um, the funds are originating from an EPA grant that we've talked about a little bit already that was awarded to us. Um, and this EPA grant does sunset in 2029. So what that means for recipients is that you'll have time to spend the money up to the end of that time period. However, depending on the grant application you submit and that gets approved, you may spend your funds sooner than that. Um, there is no requirement other than funds need to be spent by 2029. And again, we'll work with you all on the specifics of how the funds will be distributed um, and how you can use them. None of the grants do have a floor requirement. So eligible projects can be really small amounts, but they do have ceiling amounts and they'll be detailed a little bit more here by my colleague in a moment. Next slide, please. Um, so these grants are wonderful and that the eligibility is very broad. We'll be able to accept applications from nearly every entity type, except for private businesses and residences. However, uh, conservation districts can apply for grants and then we can move the funds through the conservation districts if they choose to work with private entities. So there's a way to still work with, with the little guys. Um, something to keep in mind if you think you wanna apply for these is that you do have to have a unique identity ID and a SAM.gov registration and these take time, cost nothing. So please, if you think you're gonna apply for these grants, start these, pro these processes now because it does take some time to establish those required um, and uh, identifiers to apply for the grants. And finally, all of the grants do require 25% non-federal match as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, in order to provide assistance to potential applicants, the WMCC has developed grant program guidelines that are currently under internal DNRC review. So our team put together the guidelines our next step was to run them through DNRC to make sure that they comply with all of DNRC's requirements for distributing a federal grant. Um, and as Steph already covered, there's gonna be four competitive grant programs that we will elaborate on further down into the presentation. Um, next slide, please. Once we complete our internal review of these grant guidelines, we're going to open up a public comment period where you and anyone else can provide input into the guidelines during a 30 day period which we anticipate will happen this summer. That's when we'll be at the stage where we are looking for your creativity and your ideas. Um, we're gonna host a feedback, a facilitated feedback session on the grant program guidelines to launch the 30 day comment period. And we'll keep you posted on when this will all happen. Um, yeah, and additionally, we'll keep you posted on the process of how you can provide input. Please feel free, as Steph has mentioned, to reach out to any of us at any point if you have questions, comments, or suggestions. Um, now to the specific grants. Uh, the programs we're highlighting on the next slides are not finalized and may include all of the programs or projects. Oh, wait, sorry, and may not include all the programs or projects that could be funded. So if you don't see your idea mentioned, let us know and we can walk you through eligibility. Uh, next slide, and I'll hand it over to, I think, Kelly. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the uh, Green Stormwater Infrastructure Grant programs. We have two of them. And first, just to start, stormwater pollution is rainwater that can be contaminated with bacteria, toxic chemicals, oil, dirt, you know, or trash, and that flows through storm drains and into our local waterways. This is especially relevant for a lot of our communities in Western Montana that are MS4s, or they are systems where the stormwater does not go to water treatment plants and does just sit directly charged, discharged into our waterways. So moving into the Residential and Community Green Stormwater Infrastructure Program Grant. Next slide. And that is for residential GSI implementation with the goal to provide eligible entities with the resources to develop new or grow existing rain garden, rain barrel, or other applicable programs for residents and communities. 
And a big part of this is to support programmatic development of these programs. We would like to see them continue after the life cycle of this grant. And so if applicants are going to use the funds to build a new program, again, we would like to see that programmatic development. Um, and that would extend beyond the period of grant and potentially continue to public education and outreach activities. Applications that incorporate program programmatic development activities will be ranked more highly than those that include just one-time education and outreach activities. Additionally, it is expected that recipients will engage and educate residents about toxic pollution from stormwater. And we are also envisioning that residents will be surveyed before and after program participation. So we can really assess uh, knowledge increase and if there is a behavior change commitment as a result of these programs. Um, for this one specifically, WMCC has developed a toolkit of materials that may be used by awardees to help develop, advertise, and implement their program. And as capacity allows, WMCC staff will be available for some assistance, and that's going to be talked about more at the end of this um, presentation. As with all of our competitive grant programs, as we mentioned, there is a required 25% non-federal match that must be met. And then within this residential GSI pot of money, there is about $245,000 that we're expecting to be spent on this programmatic development. And the maximum award per application is $50,000. And like Kristen said, these are going to be open essentially until we award out the money. Um, in that green box, you can see some examples of residential GSI pro projects that these programs may support. Um, and they're included, but not limited to what you see on the screen. So just like what Kristen said, if you guys have ideas as you're listening about these projects, um, reach out and talk to us. These are not exhaustive of what we could see come out of these programs. And then moving on to our showcase GSI project, Pot of Money. So the Green Stormwater Infrastructure Project Grant for the next slide is designed to support the planning, design, and construction of two showcase green stormwater infrastructure projects in Western Montana. And these projects will be designed to mitigate stormwater pollution and reduce runoff while showcasing additional co-benefits of green stormwater infrastructure. And for the purpose of this grant, green stormwater infrastructure means stormwater management methods that seek to mimic natural environments, oftentimes through the absorption of stormwater. And it also includes, but is not limited to, methods of using soil and vegetation to promote soil percolation, evapotranspiration, and filtering and harvesting and reuse of precipitation. This grant will support projects that showcase green stormwater initiatives, like we see in the example projects. It could be stormwater parks, constructed wetlands, you know, schoolyards. It could be a lot um, of different things, but that are designed to mitigate stormwater toxins and provide communities with an amenity with co-benefits and opportunities for public engagement. So right now we're envisioning that projects that provide various, you know, nature-based recreation opportunities or other co-benefits um, like stormwater treatment and flood control will be ranked higher. And so that could include stormwater parks that have community facilities on there, um, you know, provide recreational opportunities like trails. Um, and we are envisioning that these projects will be required to have educational and or interpretive signage because a big, um, focus within a lot of these grants is that public education and outreach so we can see behavior change. We will be funding two $1.1 million projects that again will require a 25% non-federal match. And we recognize that projects of this nature and scale will likely cost more than the million dollars that we'll be providing. And so we will encourage that additional funding sources should be explored. But we're looking for um, some really awesome projects that we can start getting the ball rolling on GSI within Western Montana and really show have a showcase of how it works. All right. Good morning again. My name is Heidi Fleury. And today I'll be discussing two pots of money that we have available to address the septic leachate concerns. Um, but before I start into the pots of money, I thought that I would mention that the Flathead Basin Commission, which is now us, right, supported its first investigation into septic leachate non-point source issues in 91, or I'm sorry, in 1981, 
When they worked with the Whitefish Water and Sewer District to investigate septic failures around Whitefish Lake. So septic related water quality concerns are not new to us around here, but with the rapid development of Western Montana, um, it's experience, we're forced to look at new ways to solve old problems. And this funding is hopefully going to support projects that look at these new ways to solve old problems. So from 1981 to now, the commission has partnered with a lot of local entities and they've worked on several different septic leachate studies and created other innovative education tools that are just available for the Flathead Basin right now. So we look forward to working with everybody on the septic leachate programs. And I just wanted to say one last thing, I'm the staff assistant for the on-site wastewater treatment committee. And uh, Mike Copel is currently the chair of that. And he just wanted to invite anybody that would like to come to that meeting for the development of it. Right now we meet Thursday, the last Thursday of the month from 9 a.m. to 10.30. And we're currently in the idea gathering phase. So we welcome all new perspectives. So we have a good history of septic leachate work in Western Montana. Next slide, please. Our first pot of money that we have to address septic leachate is for is to support projects that benefit local water quality by replacing septic systems or connecting to sewer services. That can look like a lot of different things. Some of the more interesting projects that we've been reading about include resident owned trailer parks that work to revitalize water and sewer infrastructure or connect to city services. Our funds could help get the planning and design of similar projects like that started. And it can also be used for the costs related to sewer district or municipal hookups. Um, additionally, this funding can also help cost share upgrades for aging or failing septic systems. So there are a number of different examples that we could use for this. And I'm sure that everybody in this meeting probably has some other cool things that we haven't even heard of. That's just what we've been looking at. Uh, that pot of money is $238,000. The maximum awards are $80,000. And again, that's a 25% non-federal match. Next slide, please. Our other pot of funding is for residential septic system education and maintenance programs. Next slide. Uh, so this pot of money is half a million dollars, and it is a little bit larger because commission members, partners, and water quality experts from around Western Montana have identified homeowner education on septic system management as a knowledge gap that we hope we can work to close. So in a few minutes, you'll hear from the Lake County Conservation District about a pilot project that WMCC worked with them on since 2021 for residential septic system and maintenance education and outreach in Lake and Flathead counties. Uh, the additional uses for this funding could be different landowner education series, or it could, um, you could hold a conference for experts. So uh, the kind of people who are thinking about this all the time could get together and talk about shared concerns. So we have a lot of different ways that this education and outreach funding could be used. It can just be used for education. It can be used for maintenance and education programs. Uh, there are lots of different examples. Next slide, oh, I'm sorry. And then the maximum award amount, I'm sorry, is $50,000, same 25% match. Next slide. So I had mentioned that uh, over the years, WMCC had worked to create some novel education and outreach tools. I just wanted to share this really quickly at the end of my septic presentation. Um, what you're looking at here is just a snapshot of the Flathead Basin septic risk model. And it is a really neat tool that can be very visually impactful that uh, my coworker, Emily Henry, helped create a few years ago. So it looks at different physical characteristics of the landscape, including depth to groundwater, distance to surface water, slope, and different soil variables. 
And then it ranks it as with the risk of septic leachate. And so it's a, if you're doing outreach and education, uh, we all know that visuals are very helpful for talking to people about these complex issues. And this model is really neat. We are currently trying to secure grant funding to expand this across all of Western Montana, but that hasn't quite happened yet. Um, I just wanted you guys to have the link to this so you could check it out. Thank you. Well, teamwork makes the dream work, right? We're partners with you in this endeavor. Our WMCC grant staff will be here to help you throughout the grant life cycle, answering questions and providing guidance from application to grant administration and through closeout. To achieve our goals through these grant programs, we emphasize collaboration and partnerships between local communities, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations. Together, through promoting citizen engagement, knowledge sharing, targeted outreach, education, and putting into action solutions, we can reduce toxic pollutions in our Western Montana water bodies. You'll see examples of these collaborations in the next few slides, and we look forward to working with all of you. So that was a quick overview of all of these different grant programs we have. And now I'd like to pass it over to some great partners that we have um, that have worked on some similar programs that we've collaborated on in the past. So first, um, I want to mention that as you're looking at these programs, as they're talking about these programs, we have toolkits and resources available so that you can kick off your own program in your area. We'd really like to be transparent that we want to share everything. We want to collaborate on things. We want you to take what we have and make it your own because no one needs to reinvent the wheel. If we've got something good, I'm happy to share it. So I'll pass it over first to Emily. Great. Thank you, Steph. If you can go on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to be chatting a little bit about um, the Flathead Rain Garden Initiative, which, as Steph mentioned, is kind of one example of a program that could be eligible for funding under that residential and community green stormwater infrastructure grant program. So this is just kind of, and I meant to get, get your wheels turning, get some ideas flowing for you. Um, and this could be a model that you could follow if your organization was interested in implementing something similar. So this program specifically was created in 2020 with the goal of empowering Flathead County residents to build rain gardens on their property. So for those that maybe aren't familiar, um, rain gardens are just one type of green infrastructure that are designed to capture, filter, and absorb any stormwater runoff that comes from rooftops, driveways, other hard surfaces. So these kind of landscaped depressions that are meant to um, protect water quality. Next slide, Steph. So the way that this program is kind of set up, um, it's run through a partnership between the Flathead Conservation District, the Western Montana Conservation Commission, and the City of Kalispell. And I did see uh, both City of Kalispell and Flathead Conservation District folks online. So I'm gonna count on you to fill in any gaps um, if I miss anything. But these are kind of the three primary partner organizations um, that provide capacity support for this program um, and also oftentimes will use their own uh, operational funds, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> operational funds to support uh, the program operations. So outside of those three primary partners, this program also has many external supporters. So oftentimes there's a Big Sky Watershed Corps member or an AmeriCorps member um, that supports these program operations. And I had the pleasure of uh, serving in that role when I was an AmeriCorps member myself. Um, this program has also previously received funding through the DEQ, EPA, and the Montana Association of Conservation Districts. <clears throat> and we have some uh, great local business partnerships as well. So the Center for Native Plants uh, provides really incredible support support for our program participants. Um, they oftentimes will, will help our participants identify the best native plants for their gardens and help with some of the, the planning. Um, we also recently have developed a relationship with Dirt Rich Compost, um, which is a newer partner, but we have kind of a similar relationship to them that we do with the Center for Native Plants. 
Next slide, please. And so the way that this um, kind of program works, we provide support to residents in three primary ways. Um, and this kind of ebbs and flows depending on the capacity, energy time of all of the partner organization staff. Um, but those three buckets of support are technical support, financial support, and then we also do help with physical implementation, actually getting out there and building the gardens um, when our capacity allows. Next slide. So within that realm of technical support, um, one of the primary things that we do as staff is help conduct site visits. Um, and so these involve actually going to an interested resident's property, uh, having a conversation with them, talking about rain gardens more generally, what the process looks like for building one. Um, and usually we'll help identify a suitable location for a rain garden on their property based on um, their preferences and their needs. We do have a number of resources online on our program website, and we'll share the link for that if it hasn't already been shared in the chat. Um, but we do have a, a do-it-yourself workbook, and this kind of walks folks through step-by-step um, -step the planning and designing of their garden all the way through. We have some pre-made designs as well um, that are really just designed to spark inspiration in folks, get them thinking about rain gardens. They can be really easily modified based on an individual's plant preferences or size preferences. Partner organization staff also assist with individualized design guidance kind of when our capacity allows. Um, and so we do have a list of native plants uh, that was co-created with the Center for Native Plants. Um, and that's meant to, to help folks identify plants for each zone of their rain garden, whether that's in the middle of the garden that's getting flooded often or kind of on the edges that is a little bit more drought tolerant. Um, and so we'll oftentimes walk folks through that list, help them get a feel for what plants they want to see as far as bloom time, um, the amount of sun exposure they have, all of that stuff. We also will host workshops and do other kind of fun events. Um, to help teach folks about rain gardens, the different benefits that they can provide, and how they can get involved in the program and build one themselves. Um, so for the past two years, we have hosted a walking tour in downtown Kalispell. So we have um, a number of past program participants that have built rain gardens within a, a pretty concentrated area. And so the past couple of years, we've taken folks on a walking tour of those gardens um, to hear from those program participants, see the gardens, hear fun stories, and just learn a little bit more about the gardens themselves. I also want to mention, and Steph um, already said this, but just reiterating that all of these resources I've talked about are available to all of you. So these can really easily be made um, generalized. Right now they're flathead specific, but they could easily be made um, usable for any area in Western Montana. And we're eager to kind of create these toolkits um, for any folks that would be interested in implementing a similar program um, across Western Montana. Next slide, Steph. Within the realm of financial support, we do have a homeowner incentive agreement program um, that is between our partner organizations and the participant themselves. And the way this works, there's kind of a, a tiered funding mechanism that gives our participants money based on the amount of impervious area that will be contributing to a proposed garden. So that means the bigger the area, the more rooftop or driveway or sidewalk that's going to be draining water to a garden, uh, that garden would be eligible for more money. So that participant would qualify for more money um, because theoretically that garden would be doing a little bit more work to protect water quality. So that's kind of how the current um, agreement works with this program. And we do have an online impervious area calculator tool. It's actually very simple. It just uses aerial imagery, but gives our participants a way to estimate the size of their roof or their driveway or whatever hard surface um, so they can figure out which of those funding tiers they would fall into. The money from this agreement uh, comes in the form of a gift certificate, either to the Center for Native Plants to help them purchase native plants for their gardens, or very recently we've expanded to include gift certificates to dirt rich compost as well for folks to buy compost for these gardens if, if they choose. Um, so having those local business partnerships again are incredibly important uh, for this program. In exchange for their funding, um, we do ask our homeowners to do a couple of things. So we ask that they maintain their garden, um, keep it looking nice and functioning well. 
We ask them to display a yard sign that we provide for them. And that's what's shown in the photo there. Um, and that's really just meant to catch people's eyes, let them know a little bit more about rain gardens and the work that they do, and also plug our program a little bit. And we ask them to add their garden to an online map that's on the program website. And the purpose of that map is to um, let community members know where the rain gardens are in their community, get a little bit more information about them. And it's also a way for us as the staff to track the impact of this program and how, how well we're doing. Next slide. And then within the realm of physical implementation, you know, when we can, we do try to get out there and help plant gardens um, whenever we can. Um, we've, in conversations with folks, we found that this is really the biggest barrier to implementation um, or for participation in this program. Um, because rain gardens are landscaped depressions, it, you got to re remove a lot of dirt uh, for a rain garden to really be functional. And that takes a lot of effort and not everyone has the physical ability to do that. So we do try to help when we can. Um, and this is often the biggest contribution that an AmeriCorps member makes um, if they are serving with this program. So I did a lot of that during my two terms. Um, and I think it really made it a lot easier for folks to participate in this program. Next slide. So even though this has been a pretty successful program, uh, we're still always looking for ways we can help help it grow and improve. Um, a couple of ideas we have for how we might do that. We're thinking about developing a base of volunteers that can help uh, partner organization staff with that physical implementation aspect. So um, having this kind of ready group of folks that would be willing to go out and help build a rain garden, help get in the dirt um, for folks that might be wanting to participate. Um, we're still working on figuring out what the logistics of that might look like, but that's an idea. Kind of similarly, um, I think it would be great if we could contract with a local landscaping company um, to pay for the building of X number of rain gardens per year um, that then we could we as the partner organizations could hold that contract and then um, work with that landscaping company to help build a rain garden on um, private property for whoever wanted to participate. Um, so again, that's really trying to help eliminate as many barriers to participation as possible. And finally, we've been kind of tossing around this idea of a referral incentive program um, where past participants in the program can get some kind of prize or incentive for referring their friend, their neighbor, um, whoever else to participate. So again, just a couple of ideas we're, we're thinking about for how we can even get this program uh, more established throughout the community and get even more traction. Next slide. And uh, yeah, I just encourage you, if you want to learn more about the program, there's a lot more information on the program website. You can get there with a QR code or that tiny URL. Um, and also would encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions or um, want to learn more about the program. Thanks, Emily. I'm going to pass it over to our next partner who's going to speak today from the Lake County Conservation District. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm Caroline McDonald. I am the conservation coordinator for the Lake County Conservation District. I want to give a quick shout out to Heidi, who uh, used to sit in this chair uh, up until just about a year ago. Um, so there may even be some opportunities for questions where she can provide some additional feedback. Um, you know, I just have to say, Emily, I am, you know, I am so jealous. Your your presentation gets pretty flowers and sunshine, and I get irreverent stickers about poo. But that's okay. It's an important topic, and uh, we have uh, excited staff who are really interested in it. And so we we can talk about septic all day long. So thank you for all the work that you've done beforehand to help uh, give us a platform for doing this pilot. Um, but also, again, a little jealous that you're now doing uh, uh, get to work with pretty flowers. Um, so um, I'm going to come back a little later in this presentation. But first, I want to queue up um, our big sky watershed person, as Emily mentioned, uh, the AmeriCorps folks really do play a huge part in implementation. Um, my big sky watershed member is Caroline McClung. She joins us with an integrated design engineering degree with an emphasis in environmental engineering and community develop community level development. So I'm just saying, 
somebody's going to have to put up the bail if I kidnap her because she is just perfect for this. Um, I've asked her to put together some statistics and some basics about this pilot program, and then I'm going to talk about some of our next steps. So, Caroline. All right. Well, thank you, Caroline, for that great wind up. Um, so this is going to focus specifically on the latest cycle of funding for this program. There was a previous one that we'll go into later, but this one specifically was with WMCC and FCD, as well as us at Lake County. Next slide, please. So the goals of this program were focused on the protection of surface and groundwater in the Flathead, Flathead Basin watershed area. So we specifically targeted Spring Creek, which is that top green outlined um, river or creek up near Kalispell. And then Ashley Creek right below that, that watershed is in that pink color. And then Lake Mary Ronan down at the bottom um, in that yellow color. And those were the targeted watersheds that were given to us by DEQ to focus on. And then additionally, we want to focus on education and outreach on septic leachate and wastewater contamination across the basin. Next slide. So what did this program look like for us? So originally, this was a grant from DEQ for non-point source pollution. That started in 2021 with Heidi. Um, and then the last iteration of this was a $30,000 contract between WMCC and ourselves. Um, contract was signed in 2022. Funding came through in 2023 through 2024. Um, this contract delineated money for both direct payments to customers, as well as administrating the grant and education and outreach efforts. So for the users of this program, they would submit an application through our website, either mail that in or submit electronically. And then the septic contractor that they hired would fill out a pumper reporting form after doing the septic maintenance that they were contracted for. And then the homeowner would give us a receipt or a proof of payment. And that was to ensure that they were <laughs> the work was actually done. Um, and then we would reimburse up to 50% uh, 50 50 on that up to $200. Um, that's kind of a brief overview of what that program looked like. Next slide. So the outcomes of this project, we had 164 applicants over this two year cycle. We had 100% approval rate. However, we did have a couple really outliers that did not meet any of the guidelines. They weren't in Flathead or Lake County, or they got maintenance five months ago, you know, something completely out of left field. And they were just kind of left out of these statistics. So in the first year, we distributed 25% of our funding. And in the second year, we distributed 75. This really shows that this program is really building momentum. There's a big interest in the community. We ended up running out of funding in about last month. Um, and we still have a lot of applications that we can't reimburse, um, which will come in the next cycle, hopefully in the next year. So we gained a lot of information on these septic systems through this program and through the forms that they have to fill out both the application and that pumper form. We learned that the average age of the septic systems in this program were between 20 or 15 to 20 years. And a lot of them were older than 20 years, which for a septic system is very old and less than ideal. Um, specifically with the targeted watersheds, the average distance from surface water for this program was 400 to 500 feet. Um, so that means a person's septic system was in that range away from any surface water in the area, whether that was a Little Creek or Flathead Lake. Um, and then 49% of those applicants were less than 400 feet from surface water. So this really shows us that while the average was between that range, um, a lot of them were closer um, most of them were closer, but a lot of them were much, much further away, um, kind of how that data played out. And then 70% were close to those targeted surface waters. So Spring, Ashley Creek, and Lake Mary Ronan. So while there was a lot close to surface water, most of them were not close to our targeted impacted watersheds. Kind of an interesting breakdown of that data. And then um, based on the pumper reports, we found that almost all of the pump septic systems were free of structural damage. So while they might be old, they're still in functioning condition. 92% um, of effluent filters were functional. 
So not all of these septic systems had effluent filters. Most don't. However, the ones that do, um, most of them are fully functional. So that just ensures that any um, excess se like septage leakage is going through some kind of filter before it leaves that septic system, which is ideal. You want some kind of filtration for that effluent. And then 4% of systems had a noticeable smell. So most were free of um, kind of spilling over into that septic field. Um, however, smells usually indicate some sort of failure or that maintenance hasn't occurred in a long time. Um, so there is a rising problem we can see uh, with septics in the area. All right, next slide. So we pulled out some large lessons learned. We could probably talk all afternoon about all of these lessons, but this is kind of a brief overview of what we're really pulling for the next iteration of this project. So while we had a pumper report from these contractors, it really didn't take advantage of the full level of knowledge that they have and the full de detail they have of the septic systems on the ground. And there's a ton of information we could pull. Um, and so we're really trying to improve that pumper report to be more specific and actually more helpful in changing behavior. Um, in addition, it was really important to target um, organizations like HOAs that have kind of a bigger pull of septic owners in an area instead of trying to connect with individual septic owners one on one. Um, this kind of plays into our last lesson learned. So we had a lot of passive efforts, sandwich boards and ads and things like that that we put up around affected waterways. Um, word of mouth is most effective, but it's incredibly time intensive. And that's why targeting HOAs is so important. Um, if you can word of mouth to someone and who's then gonna spread that um, to an entire organization, an entire section of homeowners, that's really important um, and something we're really trying to um, use to build that momentum further in the area. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna jump back in at this point. Um, as uh, Caroline alluded, uh, we expended all of the funding from our last contract just uh, about a month ago. And we have been working directly with DEQ to provide what we're thinking about as, as kind of some bridge funding to keep the momentum going. As, as Caroline mentioned, there seems to be a lot of word of mouth and this is really starting to gain some, some real momentum. We don't wanna lose that. So by providing some of that additional funding so that we can keep the program and alive and going until that EPA funding becomes available through WMCC, we think it's really important. But it also gives us the opportunity to do a couple of things. And since some of the folks on this call may be considering a program like this, we did wanna go into just a little bit some of the things that we're thinking about doing to help improve the program. Um, I know we all say this phrase a little too much, but move the needle when it comes to making environmental positive environmental impacts. Um, one of the things that uh, we want to do is we want to update the selection criteria so that we can really target uh, folks that are much closer to those um, surface waters. We're in negotiations of what that might exactly look like. Um, for a while, this program, because we we just weren't engaging the public in, in a way that was, was getting a lot of um, response, uh, we opened it up to anyone in either Flathead or Lake County who had not had their septic system pumped out for at least three years. Uh, so anybody who who fell within that category was was eligible for that uh, that cost share program. We're looking at refining that now, uh, getting it back to being able to really impact. Even though, as Caroline mentioned, uh, almost fifty percent of the folks were within that uh, four to five hundred feet um, from existing surface water, uh, we want to also spend some serious time with the septic contractors. You know, what are you seeing as you're out there? Give us your direct experience with the kinds of unintended consequences from this system or that system. What do we need to look for? And how can that then inform both a new pumper report, but also 
what we need to do when we're out there doing uh, updated education. We're also looking at putting together kind of a follow-up plan for homeowners so they get reminders after that, whether it's a three-year or a five-year kind of recommendation to have their septic system looked at again. So we're really looking at taking this kind of broader, hey, let's see how this works in the community program, take all those lessons learned and make it more effective. Having said that, if there are folks on the call who have questions, please do feel free to reach out to me. Or if you have ideas on how we can do this better, we are taking all that information now. We're working uh, very diligently so that when it does get time to apply for those EPA funds, we're going to have a program that works well, works well, has demonstrable um, results, and that hopefully is replicable as well. So we're uh, more than interested in having other input from folks who are, are participating at this point. So next slide. That's me. So if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, like I said, we're, we're actively refining this. So and and thank you, Caroline, for including a good, um, delightful picture at the end, because I know sometimes I think about what can I do to demonstrate this? And yeah, the kinds of pictures that run through my head are not always ones we want to share, but they are interesting. Anyway, so thank you all very much. And thank you for the opportunity to get to present this to all of you. Thanks so much to both Carolines and to Emily for going over your programs. It's really neat to hear. I That data was so interesting. That was really, really cool. So I appreciate it. So to move us right along, here are some next steps. So I'd like to emphasize and reiterate just one more time that um, we're hoping, you know, we'll have toolkits. We want you to build projects similar, take this as a starting point, do something different, but we have all of these as resources for you. And so for our next steps is we are taking review and feedback from partners on our grant program guidelines. So we've been working on building up these guidelines, which include information about the programs, eligible applicants, sort of a much longer version of exactly what you heard from today and some more of the logistics in that. And then we are going to host another feedback session uh, about those grant program guidelines and then release those for public comment for an official 30 day public comment period um, so that we can best shape these guidelines to suit those who are going to apply. Because we've been looking at this content for months and months, right? So we're a little too deep in it. So we'd love to hear from all of you how to make this program the best that it can be and the most accessible that it can be. So in terms of how to stay in touch with us, um, one, you can go onto our website, which is westernmtwaters.com. Um, and I put the QR code there and you can use the contact us form. You can get our contact information on there if you'd like to reach out to us directly. Or you can use that QR code there to send us an email. It will auto populate the subject line so that I know that you are reaching out specifically about this meeting today. Um, but we also have that general email, the DNR card WMCC at mt.gov that you are welcome to email. That's just a general, it'll help reach our whole team if you're not sure who to reach out to. So now um, we have time for feedback and questions actually moving right along exactly with our agenda. Um, so, um, oh, before we jump into that, I also wanna add on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter um, and I'm hoping to include grant information as well in those newsletters. And we have you on a list since we invited you. So if you'd like to continue to be on that list, just say nothing and stay on the list. But if you really don't wanna be on the list anymore, you can send Heidi an email and she'll take you off of it too. Great. So now we'll open it up to feedback and questions and I'll pass it over to some of my team members in case there were any questions in the chat. Uh, one question that popped up in the chat that we did answer was if the septic programs are available outside the Flathead Basin. And just to reiterate, all four of our competitive grant programs are going to be available anywhere in western Montana. So anywhere west of the Continental Divide. Um, just based on our history, we so happen to have more examples of Flathead programs since we uh, 
formerly were the Flathead Basin Commission, but this is open for all of Western Montana. And if you don't want to put it in the chat, you're welcome to raise your hand, use that function too. All right, we've thrown a lot of information at you today. So I'm sure some things will come up as you sit and digest this info. Um, so I'd like to share next, just all of our contact information. Hey, it was, up. They yeah, started, they started coming in into the chat. So maybe we Perfect. can go into those. <laughs> so first one, can you tell us when you anticipate the grant programs being available with application deadlines set? So we're anticipating the four competitive grant programs to open in early 2025, so the beginning of next year. And then uh, the programs will be open on a rolling basis until the funds are expended. Let's see. Next question. Do you anticipate the 25% share being a barrier? Is the share completely financial, financial or can it be in kind? Good question. So cost share or match. 25% non-federal match, it can be in kind. Um, we do recognize that that could be a barrier for some folks, and we would love to have conversations, chat about what that could look like or how that could be achieved in various different ways. For example, the two different programs that we saw presentations on today do um, sub, or one of the programs, the septic maintenance program has a resident cost share component. And so part of that cost share could be in that form. It can be in kind for staff, staff support and running programs. We have a lot of options, so we'd be happy to chat about what those might look like. Let's see. What level of effort do you anticipate for the grant applications? Good question. Does anyone else wanna take that or you want me to keep going? I can jump in on that. Um, the Really the only guidance I can say, so because WMCC is administratively attached to DNRC with the CARD division, um, we have been using um, kind of the ARPA program guidelines as a basis for what's, what's what we're drafting currently in our program guidelines. So I guess the comparison, if anyone's familiar, I think it would be kind of similar to an ARPA level application. Um, but I think that's still something that we're working through as a team and trying to decide what would be um, the best for us and also the least uh, cumbersome for all of our applicants. Anyone else on the team can chime in too if I misrepresent anything. We do hope to keep the applications pretty simple, focusing on the scope of work, the timeline, and the budget. Uh, there won't be a ton of extra information that you'll have to get together, but there could be some other things. And then the last question in the chat we have right now are is, are there target water reaches for the septic leachate program beyond the Flathead region? That's a great question. Um, I have some ideas, but folks that have participated in that program, do you want to jump in and explain what that looks like? Or would you like me to explain that? So targeted reaches, those I believe for the Flathead program were coming from DEQ. So we do have that septic risk model for just the flathead right now, but like Heidi mentioned, we are hoping to expand it to all of Western Montana. Um, honestly, right, it, I, I would say folks that within the other watersheds, if you're working on water, you probably know which which watershed, which water reaches are impaired or have issues. And so while the model itself hasn't been expanded and we haven't worked with DEQ on those others, I think we could, if that is of interest for that type of program, I think it's easy to develop something to that extent or have some target reaches based on already impaired water bodies within the area that you're working. But uh not right now, right? So 
it's just dependent on how the program would be structured in a new area. But I think there's potential to create that type of structure for it if that's of interest. Also, any any septic systems near water bodies, right? Those would be high target. And so an easy metric would be just distance from water body to start with. And it can get more complicated from there, but I think that's a good starting spot as well. Anything else anyone wants to add to that? I think hey, more. Casey. Sorry. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is that we don't have um, on the reservation, we don't have those DEQ impaired waterways maps. And so that is that is a conversation that came up very quickly when we were talking about um, or negotiating for that additional funding. And that is exactly, as you mentioned, Casey, what we ended up agreeing to is either identification on one of the um, impaired waterways as as defined by DEQ or within a certain distance from surface water and that surface water would also have to be identified. So that's kind of the um, the workaround that we're using to still uh, kind of be within those those targeted but also respecting that there are different jurisdictions and that kind of thing in this in this program. And I think more broadly too, just with all of these uh, programs, is that we understand what a what makes a successful program in the Flathead might look a lot different than what makes a successful program down in the Bitterroot River Valley, down in Butte. Um, and so we really want these programs to fit the needs of the local communities and recognize that those might look different between the communities, and that there's not a one size fits all approach to how we implement this grant money. Just giving a moment to see if any other follow-up questions populate our chat. We've got another 20 minutes to take if we would like it, so. Why well, I used to teach students and the biggest hurdle is to learn to pause. So it's like counting in your head, how long do people need? <laughs> and I just want to reiterate that, you know, even if something comes up that may or may not seem relevant, but is some somewhat tied to these, if you have ideas, questions, uh, definitely feel free to reach out to any any of us on, on those ideas and We'd love to chat about that, even if it's just how do we improve existing programs or is there something else that we can help support? Um, but also specifically, if it's, you know, you're interested in a grant opportunity into the future and have something in mind, we would love to chat about that as well. So just excited for whatever those questions may look like and happy to field those via email, calls, in person, or if you have them uh, in chat or right now. All right, along those lines, just want to thank you all for listening, for providing your input today. We're excited to hear more from you. Um, we're excited to continue to work with you. We really are excited for this opportunity to put these funds into Western Montana and shape some more programs in this region and work with all of you to do that, which is really a neat opportunity. Um, I also want to mention that we are not the only organization in Western Montana to receive funds from this same uh, Columbia River Basin Toxics Reduction Program. So the Flathead Lake Biostation has a program as well as the CSKT. So it's really neat how much came in to the state kind of all around the same time to help protect water quality in Western Montana. So thanks so much for being here. Again, please let us know if you have any other questions. Reach out to any of us. We're happy to answer. Reach out to that general email. We look forward to continuing to work with you.